Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak at the webinar. So today I'm going to be talking to you about Tabla sapiens, which is one of the very first multiple organ, multiple donor references that make the first uh, draft of the human cell atlas. So the reason why all organisms cell atlas are so important is because they can actually provide a reference, meaning a comparison point of the normal state. A key goal in biomedical research is really to understand the mechanism of disease and to develop new technologies which will lead to actionable diagnostics and effective therapies. And so to do that, we first need to understand what is it that are the differences from the normal state. This is the only way that we're actually going to be able to understand the disease, and then we can infer what went wrong and intervene to treat or manage uh, those uh, conditions. And in order for us to get to this, we are using a combination of single cell transcriptomics and thorough computational analysis. And before I continue, let me actually try to convince you why single cell transcriptomic data is the way to approach it. So I'll try to explain why each individual cell matters. Let's use a glass of juice and some individual fruits as a reference for what an organ tissue and cells um, can, can mean. If all the fruits are good, when we combine them, the juice will taste exactly as we expected it to taste. But if we happen to add a rotten apple, the juice would look just the same. We wouldn't be able to tell just by looking at the bulk of the, of the glass, but which, which of the fruits was, was wrong. And so in, that would mean that if there was some type of disease in one of the cell types of a given organ, just by looking at the organ, we wouldn't be able to tell which part was sick, or we might not even be able to detect that we was sick in the first place. And then why is it that transcriptomics is so important? Virtually every cell in the body has the same genome, so the, the same DNA, but your skin cells and your liver cells are not always expressing the same set of genes at the same time. And basically, this is when the transcript home becomes so useful because it gives us in the, the closer to real time um, expression. So it let us look at what RNA is actually being um, transcribed and is a proxy for us to measure real-time gene expression in any given cell, letting us see what are the different behaviors that we can expect within an organ. So one of the things that we have done for Tabula sapiens is to pay special consideration to the data collection. So we are very interested in this idea of being able to collect as many tissues and organs from a single donor as possible, because this really opens up the door to do organ to organ comparison while being able to discount, so to speak, the, the variation that we have on person to person. And so in order to achieve that, as part of the Tabla Sapiens Consortia, we have partnered with Donor Network West, which is a nonprofit that facilitates organ procurement for research organizations. And so through Donor Network West, we get access to um, donors that meet our criteria. Um, keep in mind that the goal of Tabla Savings is to build these as close as possible of a healthy reference. And so we, we have certain criteria on which organs we would like to include in the in the atlas so we partner with donor network quest to identify these key donors that will let us build the um, the atlas 
And then we have as part of the consortia, organ specific teams. So these are teams of experts in the biology of any given organ. So for each organ, we have a team. These teams are the ones who are responsible for the cell dissociation because the different um, cell types and the different organs require different protocols in order to optimize the processing of the, of the samples. But then if we would continue these like diverging path that each team would do their own processing, we would encounter very likely many technical artifacts down the line. So what we do is after cell dissociation, we centralize the processing of the samples to, in order to reduce artifacts that could come, for example, different strategies for sorting cells, which is required in order for us to do the smart seek libraries or in how the 10X genomics um, is handled. And then also how we think about sequencing, sequencing depth, and so on. So all of this is centralized as well as the data analysis. And when we kind of like thinking about data analysis, this is what starts once we have kind of like the data coming out of the sequencer. So we have this collection of files. We have, we align them according to the, the human reference genome. And then we get to a matrix that looks very much like rock counts cell by genes um, in the format of a table. In the human samples, we realized that there was a lot of contamination from the ambient RNA. There are different reasons why this could be um, playing a role in here. It might be due to the downtime of the donors, which we try to minimize, but is always there, or the travel time from the hospital to the lab for dissociation. So we are employing DeconX to uh, computationally remove the contribution of ambient RNA. We then get this matrix of corrected counts, and then we perform a dimensionality reduction harmonization using SCVI to get to this um, matrix that is still unannotated, but then let us bring all the data into a single latent space that we can start to visually inspect. And so, after this initial pre-processing of data, the first type of um, metadata variables that we can start looking into and not, not over-interpreting the, the UMAP, but just using this as, um, as a visual guide, we can see that for some tissues, um, we see overlap of the, of the expression in terms of the region of the UMAP that they are. Others, like we have kind of the, the bladder at the, at the bottom, they tend to be more kind of like very specific. And other variables like donors, how are the donors mixing? Do we have for the same organ, do we see kind of like donor uh, donor to donor um, aligning because that was part of the harmonization effort that we did, the contribution of the different library methods between 10X and SmartSeq, how does the sexual dimorphism in gene expression might look like, or do we have which organs do we have uh, more um, contribution of endothelial functional compartments versus immune and so on. So these are all uh, metadata variables that we can start looking at. And in summary, at this stage, we are able to get to the very first kind of like overview of the data set. So Tabla Sapiens contains um, data from 15 donors across 24 tissues in a total of 483,000 cells. This is um, from, you can appreciate from this figure here that for four donors, we were actually able to collect a large number of tissues from that single donor. And then we try to complete um, the, hat, the atlas using data from um, additional 11 donors. And we also have access to clinical metadata that really help us uh, build a layer of, of interpretability into what is the gene expression that we are seeing. Is that because the age is different, the BMI was different, was there any underlying disease that could justify those patterns in gene expression? This is still at the very kind of like abstract level 
But the next step, and let's go back here to our blob that we are using as um, illustration for what the data looks like. The single most important step on this workflow then is to actually annotate the data, is to put labels into each of these dots that we have in the UMAP. And in Tableau Sapiens, we try to do um, a strategy that we take advantage of our network of experts in the tissue biology, while also leveraging computational efforts that accelerate how the um, annotations can be performed. And so let me walk you through an illustration of what that looks like. So when we had TSP1, our first donor, for those tissues, we did not have annotations within our consortium. So we asked our experts to do a draft annotation all manually based on known marker genes for the cell types, differential gene expression, knowledge that was available in the literature, and the experts created this draft reference. And then we have TSP2, our second donor, which corresponds to a new subset of Tableau sapiens, but this one is unclassified. And what we really want to do is we want to somehow be able to bring them together and then get these automatically classified data set. So trying to accelerate this process before we engage our experts to then do a loop of curation that will improve the reference. So when that subset becomes TSP3 and so on, it's faster. And in order for us to do this, we were um, searching through the literature. There, one of the nice things of working in a consortia as large um, established sapient, which is um, roughly 150 people participating into the project, is there are always computational methods that are emerging. So we, we were working on different strategies, computational strategies on how to annotate the data, but we realized that there were advantages and disadvantages to all of them. So we decided instead to take a different approach and was to, we, we come up with this idea of building popular vote. So what does popular vote in this case mean? Let me walk you through the, um, under the hood of, of Poppy. So we are trying to solve this problem that we have uh, existing reference data set that we have annotated that corresponds to a fraction of the data. And then we have, have an unannotated query data set. So we have this panoply of methods and some of them are self-supervised, some of them are supervised. What if we would use all of them, use this to output an annotated query data set that would contain predicted annotations and consensus scores together with metrics that help the experts on the reviewing step. So what we what we provide to the experts once we give them the automatically annotated data set is these scores that say this is a predicted label, but we have a confidence of 90% or we have a confidence of 10%. Um, and one of the things that we try to do in here is to come up with a mechanism to untie the votes. So for example, if we have um, six methods, we would be able to be in a position of having kind of like three, three uh, votes, for example. And we do not want to be necessarily kind of like guessing at random which one might be better. So. As part of our efforts on building references, we really try to leverage um, the cell ontology, which is um, controlled vocabulary for the nomenclature of cell types that also captures the idea of lineages. So in this illustration in here, if we take the example of T cells, CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells are, um, nested under T cell, and so is the CD4, CD25 in relation to the CD4. So one method that we have in POPV, which is on class, takes advantage of the structure of the graph on the cell ontology. And so what we do is we use 
on class to untie the prediction. So if we have three methods scoring one cell type and three methods scoring another one, we are going to take the decision based on which uh, branch is on class predicting. So that is the information that we are passing on top of just like a simple uh, popular vote. And then we compared, how does POP we compare with the single method usage? And we can see that the performance is slightly improved to some of the, of the best methods, but re it reliably um, outperforms all of them, which is which is not surprising because it's taking advantage of, of literally all of them. But there are other advantages that come with POP V, which is let's say that in the consortia, someone would have already annotated a really good data set for one of the tissues. Let's use, for example, uh, the brain. But the brain, um, the it could have been that the cell types were not annotated to the cell um, ontology. So we wouldn't be able to take advantage of this scoring mechanism that we have created. So what we also did is we included an um, automatic way of translating the cells using um, an NLP method. So th those labels get translated to the cell ontology. Then we can use them as um, references, and then we can evaluate the predictions and the consensus. And what we can also do by taking advantage of this is crowdsource annotations. So if we then have, we also have different users providing annotations, we can use these as input to the method to update the annotations based on consensus score that we compute out of the different users. And um, for us, it's very important that these tools are available to the community. And so you can um, walk through the, um, the details of how you would use um, POPV with Tableau Sapiens. And there is also um, a collab notebook that you can access from the, um, from the GitHub to really make um, this available to, to everyone that could benefit from, from using it. So bringing us back to kind of like our cartoon representation, we go through this loop over and over for as many donors as we add to the atlas until we then converge into this new reference that is what we are currently having as the Tableau Sapiens publication. And so what we have achieved with Tableau Sapiens is this incredibly um, annotated resource. These are really high value annotations because they take um, advantage of tissue expert manual curation at a couple of steps. And um, basically at the moment, the Atlas has um, annotated 475 cell types. And I'll kind of like, I'll, I'll give you um, a preview in how the, how the Atlas is growing in, the, in, in V2 at the, at the end of the talk. But for now, the other thing that we also have as a byproduct of annotating the cell types in such a detail and taking advantage of the, um, of the cell ontology uh, controlled vocabulary is that something that is very um, useful, not only in annotation, but in other um, validation experiments is marker genes. And out of the computational methods that we have derived, we are also able to computationally generate marker genes for any of the cell types that um, we have annotated in Tableau Sapiens and also propagate that to the entire cell ontology. And you can access this resource on our um, web portal um, into the marker genes tab. And basically there is a drop down menu that you can choose um, your cell type of interest and you're gonna get suggestions of marker genes. These are very useful, not just to annotate an independent data set, but in particular, when someone is designing an experiment that they want to validate a given cell type or cell state, they can use this to select which RNA fish probes to design or which antibodies to include in the panel, um, for instance. So now that we have 
our atlas. And I'm coloring this for tissue because 475 labels is way too much to, to show um, with colors. But each of these dots now has a label. How do we use them? And um, one, one way of thinking about it is cross tissue analysis. So if we would select as in kind of like we would subset the atlas cell type, for example, as macrophages, something that we see in here is that when we just grab all the cells that have been labeled as macrophages, we see that on the EO map, they are fairly uh, overlapping. Other macrophages are also tissue resident cells, so it's not surprising that they're going to be um, also clustering with their respective tissues. But we see a um, reasonable distribution across the, the different tissues. And in this sense, we can kind of like start asking questions of, okay, we have these over 336,000 cells. How are they, are they similar to one another? So we can take something like a person um, correlation across the tissues using just the macrophages. Then we can see that our clusters that are emerging. So it does look like the macrophages in the uterus, memory skin, muscle and bladder are more similar to each other than to those that are, for example, present um, in the lung, then we can take a step further and we can um, kind of like ask, okay, so what are the marker genes that are uh, shaping these correlations and how are they distributed across the different tissues and so what we observe in here is that in the macrophages, some genes are highly specific to one tissue, while others are specific to multiple tissues. So to kind of like, they are, they are a, rather an indication perhaps of a functional tissue group. Um, and this supports the idea that the tissue resident macrophages um, are known to carry out specialized um, functions. And we, we can continue kind of like playing with our atlas. So we go back to the entire atlas. We think about what about in the immune cell types, for example. So if we would take T cells, the, the representation of color is a bit more narrow that, um, that we had on the macrophages. What we can see in here is that we can characterize the lineage relationships between the, the T cells by assembling, um, doing kind of like the, the computational assembly, the receptor sequences. We did this for, for TSP2. And so multiple T cell lineages are distributed across various tissues in the, in the body. Um, but the large clones often reside in multiple organs and they are also shared um, across, across donors. Um, and so this represents a variety of T cell subtypes that we can um, identify in the atlas. So what about the counter the, the companions of T cells, the B cells? One um, thing that I find quite interesting whenever I look at this is that you can see a strong, um, contribution of lymph nodes, so like the, this brown color that we see in here, to, to B cells in the, in the entire atlas. And in this particular case, so B cells are known to undergo fast switch recombination to diversify the umeral immune response. So we classified every B cell in the data set as um, immunoglobin A, G, M, um, or D. And uh, the A, the IgA is known to interact with pathogens and common cells at the, at the mucosa. IgGG is known to be involved in direct neutralization of pathogens. IgM is typically expressed in naive B cells or, or secreted in the first response to pathogens. And um, consistent with these, we have identified opposing gradients of um, the prevalence of IgA and IgM across the tissues. So blood has the lowest relative abundance of, um, of IgA, uh, and then intestine is the counterpart. 
and has the the lowest abundance of um it has a, a, the, the highest abundance of IgM balanced by a lower abundance of um of IgM. And then finally, I'd like to also show you the endothelial compartment. So when we go to the endothelial compartment, we are back into this more um, rainbow uh, scenario that we have contribution from most of the tissues in the atlas. So endothelial cells are, this is like taking the broad term. So all the cells that are associated with vessels um, around the body. And what we can, Seen, seen here is, so we're taking all the endothelial cells across all the tissues, all the donors. What are the markers for these cells? Are they tissue specific? And we found that most of them um, seem to be tissue specific, but they are shared across donors. And let me go into detail um, about this. So when we look just at the endothelial compartment, uh, we have the tissues, um, the, we have the UMAP color by tissue on the left and by donor on the right. If we focus in lung, we see that some markers seem to be very distinct on different clusters of the lung. So this suggests that there is high specificity even within uh, the same tissue and it, there is mixture across the across the donors that we had in the atlas as we, we can see on the on the plot on the on the top right and we find something similar for muscle so when we when we take a look at the muscle cells we see that we have MS, msx1 being highly expressed on the bottom uh, cluster of the muscle cells versus uh, CYP1B1, which is at the top. One that is also very interesting to dip into is the heart. So the heart, and this one here, we, we did not have um, that many contributions in terms of donors. It's, it's also something that, that I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but in terms of collecting tissues that are from donors that pass our criteria for being a good um, use for, for building a healthy reference, it ends up that very often the organs that can go for transplant, go for transplant. And, and, and that's that, that's a good thing. So organs like heart is hard for us in terms of um, the team to collect um, a large number um, of donors um, for, for, for a good reason. But kind of like looking into the heart, we see this is kind of like a very distinct cluster. So the question that we had in here is like, what markers are specific to, to the cells in the heart? And it appeared that SLC14A1 looked specific to these endothelial cells in the heart. So what we decided to do was to go and look in a completely independent data set, the human protein atlas, and in there, we look through the through the the portal. We have the we, we look into the the expression of the gene. It was not incredibly highly expressed in the endothelial cells, but for sure much higher in the heart than the others. And so we were able to take advantage of the human protein atlas to independently validate that SLC. 14A1 is a novel marker for endothelial cells in the heart. And this just um, speaks to the power of having these publicly available resources that are large scale community efforts just at a fingertip for us to test hypotheses and to, and to provide um, independent validation of whether or not we, we are going down the, the right path with, um, with our research. Uh, another thing that we can really do at scale with tablet sapiens is to look into RNA splicing. And this is a very interesting layer of gene expression regulation that has been a bit neglected in the single cell um, RNA-seq community, mo mostly due to lack of, of tools. But um, as part of the consortium, that we have 
um, with Tabula Sapient, we've been working with a group that is focused on developing novel methods to identify uh, different splicing patterns um, within single cell three prime um, transcriptomics data sets. And so in here, the splice junctions are counted in categories based on their um, annotation status. So annot annotated junction, or if the boundaries are annotated, but splice is not, one is annotated, the other isn't, the, the boundary is not annotated, but it's in a known gene, or the boundary um, of, of either of the junk is, 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 um, is, is neither of the boundaries a noun gene. So what we found is we can count across the atlas the fraction of junctions in each of this category. And there is an independent validation of 61% of the total junctions um, that have been cataloged in the RefSeq database, which is the current database for, for reference. And then we can look at the fraction of reads that are in each of these category. And from here, we see that the annotated junction, so what is already in RefSeq, tends to be expressed at higher levels and might be a reason why the other junctions are yet to be annotated. And so going a bit into the details, two genes, that we were able to um, characterize differential splicing. Mile six, uh, the exon six isoform, or the, the lack of, uh, of this isoform, has been previously described in phasic smooth muscle. So using tabula sapiens, we can actually look across different donors in different cell types and confirm whether or not we have differential regulation of this the splicing of this particular gene for different for different cell types in 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 the in the respective functional groups and it turns out that indeed we find evidence that M um, ml6 is um differentially spliced according to to the functional cell type that it is being expressed in and a similar example is for cd47 and in CD47, we, we have a similar um, example that there is also compelling evidence of differential regulation of the, of the splicing. And so therefore having different isoforms across cell types within an organ, which is, which is very interesting to, to have this level um, of regulation there. But one of the things um, about Tabula sapiens is while it is incredibly exciting to um, reveal the deep heterogeneity of the cell uh, states using the transcriptional signature, transcription isn't everything. And cell dissociation carries a, its own bias because there's always artifacts that we, we're going to have. Certain cell types are going to be easier to dissociate than others. They might be are uh, more overrepresented. There is only that amount of information that RNA, RNA layer contains. And so what we wanted to do here is to embrace other sources of data that we could that could be easy to, to collect alongside the, um, the organ procurement that we are already um, employing. And one of these is histology. So as we can see in, in here in the left, we have an example of the histology of the intestine. And in this particular example, our pathology team carefully annotated these data sets. So we have very detailed annotations within the agony of what these cell types are. But you can imagine that this is incredibly time consuming. This is literally a team of people looking through the image and agreeing on the calling for, for that particular region of the image. So one thing that we thought was, was doable uh, discussing with the team was instead of going for very fine grain annotations, actually try to evaluate functional compartments. So how what is the percent in the image that 
is um, driven that that is coming from immune cells or from endothelial cells, epithelial, stromal, and, and so on. And this gives us a measure of spatial heterogeneity across to the different organs, which can also help us think through which tissues might be more likely to uh, dissociation artifacts, but also which ones should we sample more carefully? Because whenever we are um, sampling tissues, we are always collecting small pieces. And if a tissue is incredible, or organ is incredibly spatially heterogeneous, we might um, want to sample more that tissue versus a tissue that is rather um, homogeneous. But we can also do um, a comparison to find how well is the cell type representation that we are getting from pathology. So these um, estimates across the, across the different compartments versus the cell type representation that we are getting from sequencing. This is very uh, kind of like coarse, coarse grain. It's just to give us an indication of how off um, do, we, do we are. But overall, we seem to find reasonably good um, correlation between the cell type representation that we are having in the atlas with what is expected from the, from the pathology slides. And as I was saying that we, we've been kind of like really thinking through what are the layers of information, like what can we layer on top of the atlas? What are the measurements? So I've walked you through the single cell transcriptomics, I've walked you through the subpathology, and there is one more modality that we were able to add in Tabla sapiens towards bringing a more complete picture, which is the microbiome. And the... Um, the microbiome, this is very interesting because when we think about the intestine and we have all these, these different regions, um, this is not, not lunchtime yet, at least not on the, on the West Coast, so we can see uh, the picture of kind of like the, the different regions across the intestine here, kind of like how does it actually look in the, in the tissue. And so we can... Um, compare species from adjacent regions in the small intestine. So what, what we have found is that um, we have, this is the relative abundance of the, of the species across the, the different regions of the, of the small uh, intestine and, and then the colon. And we've, we can see that there's a large fraction of species that is unique to each um, region, and this is perhaps even easier to see kind of like as we have this sunky uh, diagram. But it's interesting to call out the similarity between the ascending colon and the sigmoid colon. So most species there are shared between these two regions of the colon. And so this is just the microbiome communities. This is bacteria. We are not taking into the cell types in here, but the natural question is, we have the microbiome and do we have the single cell transcriptomics? How do they match? And so if we take a look at the T cells, it is super interesting that we do see a gradient coming left to right on that UMAP from the small intestine all the way to the, to the large intestine. This is changes in the gene expression of the T cells um, in the, across the intestine that are backed up by consistent changes in gene expression. And I found this to be a very powerful resource to, to leverage when we are really trying to understand what is the impact of the microbial communities in the composition and the behavior of, of the organ world where they are harbored in. So for Tablet sapiens, I, I kind of like walk you through the, in a nutshell, what the atlas is uh, is about and um, and kind of like what are all the, try to kind of like inspire you with some ideas of, uh, of what you can, what you can do um, with it. But for us, it's very important that this data is just readily available 
easy, accessible. And so we build a um, web portal. And so in this web portal, what we have is a summary of the different um, pieces that make up the Atlas. So if you go to the web portal, you're going to have access to, to the publication of the, of the Atlas, but also a tab of showing where you collect the data. And maybe I'm going to be able to jump in there. Let's see if this took you to, to the right screen. I believe it did. So when we go to the portal, we can kind of like scroll through. We have access to kind of like the sessions that allow us to explore the, the different data sets. They've been, there's like the full atlas or the functional compartments. If we want to take a view through the different organs, uh, there is a walkthrough of what are the different metadata variables that are available in the, in the objects. And then um, the breakdown per tissue. So this gives you direct links to each of the individual tissues that are in the Atlas, of course, combining the data of all the, all the donors. So it's literally kind of like a, a tissue um, subsetting. You can have um, a bit more detail on how, how, how is the data made? Who is the, the large consortium of incredible scientists that have contributed? Um, you also have access to the donor metrics the data, the, the, the medical metadata in here, together with links for how to get access to the raw data, the process data. And, uh, and then if you want to uh, look through the marker genes, like I was kind of like illustrating before, you can browse through here and go through like a favorite sub type of interest to find the markers. Um, this takes you to uh, the histology browser. So for the different tissues uh, and donors that we have histology sections, you can um, load them and you can kind of like readily on the portal zoom through them. Uh, there is also information about the splicing, how you can leverage POPV to annotate um, your data and some summary visualizations in case you, you would just want to do kind of like some very quick checks across the different tissues or metadata variables, find your gene of interest. So all of these is, uh, um, is available in the, in the data portal. And, and this is really key to our mission to get to, of making these resources available. And, um, and they are also part of the, of the cell by gene, um, cell census um, resource that, that you can download. So, for for the consortium, this, this is very essential in terms of accelerating scientific discovery. So as I just walk you through, all the data is easily accessible from the web portal. The different versions of the manuscript have been deposited to the bioarchive to give access to the community as soon as possible to the data, the code to, to processes on GitHub. And so in summary, what the, the current published version of Tableau Sapiens is, is a compendium of human cell types of over 20 donors and over a, close to half a million cells processed using two methods for single cell transcriptomics, um, smart six, so fax-based full-length transcript and 10x genomic tree prime, which is a microfluidic droplet base. This is over 20 terabytes and over 100K files. And then also isopathologies, uh, images that that um, are are ready to to be downloaded from from PreakShare or browsed through the um, through the portal. And back to kind of like the idea of this understanding of disease and how important it is to understand the differences from the normal state. Uh, state Tabula sapiens is part of a large effort of all organism cell atlas that we can think about in two axes. So we have the species axis and we also have the state axis. So Tableau sapien is the reference for human and we've already been able to use it to contrast with the disease atlas that we've built for the COVID tissue atlas. And for the mouse, 
we were actually able to build the reference tableau Muris, look at the perturbation like aging with tableau Murisinis, and then an intervention with parabiosis. And so this is part of a, a large effort on how is it that we can take advantage of these large scale resources to really, we, these, are, these are the equivalent of gold mines for biomedical research. How, how can we really empower the, the biomedical community to advance the, the next discoveries? And with this, with this in mind, for Tabla sapiens in particular, we are growing the multimodal reference atlas. So Tabla sapiens v2, so this, this is unpublished, uh, hopefully coming out soon. So in Tableau Sapiens V2, we, we have more than doubled the, the number of cells. We have added new tissues. So we went from 24 to 28. Uh, we went from 15 to 24 donors. And we had 475 tissue cell types. Now we have 701, out of which 190 are unique cell ontology. And the, the difference in here is we I walk you through the subtleties on the on the cell types within a given tissue. So we want to be mindful that those might be cell 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 different cell types, cell states. So we capture them differently. But in terms of the actual cell ontologies, we have 190, which is a really large catalog of all these um information. And on top of the single cell transcriptomics and the histology, in Tablet Sapiens V2, there is going to be also more comprehensive medical records, anonymized, fully, fully anonymized, um, that are going to be shared to really empower the community to leverage this large scale resource towards really taking advantage of looking into gene expression and driving hypotheses of what it might be the relevance for a given medical um, condition. And with all of this, I hope I have convinced you to to go to to go to the go to the portal, uh, browse through derived new hypotheses. Um, and I want to thank the incredible consortia of Tabula Sapiens. This is an uh, effort uh, that was led by the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco together with groups at Stanford, Berkeley, UCSF, the Donor Network West, and uh, we are supported by CZI. The, the curation in the cell biogene portal is done by the Lattice team, and we have um, a grant from AWS to host all the raw data for free on the public um, open data sets from, from AWS. And um, with this, I'm happy to, happy to take uh, any questions and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. Um, now is our Q&A uh, session. So um, you are welcome to uh, mute yourself as question. Um, before that, there's uh, several questions during your talk. So I'm gonna um, repeat the question and then you could answer. So the first question, I think it, it's uh, um, sent uh, during the first 10 minutes of the talk uh, is from Dr. Bolio. Why is the stomach not included? Great question. And the stomach was, oops, the stomach was not included, but it should be included now. So in V2, stomach is coming. The, the reason why um, some organs might not be included is we really rely on our network of experts. So if we don't have a group to collaborate with that can provide the expertise both for the cell type dissociation and the cell type annotation, it makes it hard for the consortia to include it. Okay, um, hope that answer um, on Bonya's question. And then the thank second you. question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the second question is from uh, Sue. Uh, for the histology analysis, are you using stereologic principles for unbiased sampling for area functions, volume fractions, or are you performing analysis based on a single section in a region? So, um. This question would be much, much better handled by the pathology team. I'm the computational representative, so I'm going to do my best here. Uh, we try to get 
some representation across the tissue. And that is why when you go through the, the portal, you're gonna see that there are different sections within the same donor and um and and organ. But um the analysis from the computational side, which is the angle that I can speak up, we haven't we have felt that that is a good resource for exploration, but we haven't really moved the needle and using it for deep analysis. Um, I would encourage you to write me and I can put you in touch with the pathology team and they're going to be able to give you a much better answer than what I can. Okay. And then the next question uh, is, let me check. What is the minimum number of sequence, sequence reads for cell you used as exclusion or inclusion for good single cell data? Large size cells beyond the capacity of 10 times genomics platform are less represented in the data. Are you going to add single nuclear data in future? Great question. So um, the current filtering is for cells to pass the QC, it, each cell needs to have a minimum of 200 uh, transcripts, unique transcripts, and 2,500 UMIs uh, if it is 10x or 2,500 reads if it is smart -seek. Some of the cells that are not really represented in 10x, we have tried to capture them already with the smart -seek. And yes, in the V2, there has been an effort to add NUC-seq as well to include more um, representation of cell types that are underrepresented in, in V1. Okay, thank you. And um, next question is from Dr. Martin. What is the sustainability model moving forward? The, these resources have are publicly hosted. Um, the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative is committed to to maintain to maintain them. In terms of growth, Tablet Sapiens was included as part of the Human Cell Atlas. And so the sustainability will be done throughout um, Human Cell Atlas. Great, so uh, next question from Dr. Adam. Uh, we are interested in cell composition of the bladder and have been surprised at a relatively low number of smooth muscle cells evidence in the atlas, given that smooth muscle is a major functional uh, component of the organ, are there any potential technique explanation for this apparent underrepresentation relative to single cell disso dissociation? That, that is a great question. So one of the decisions that was taken early in the project, so our learnings were done with the mouse atlas and dissociating the mouse or tissues is much easier, in particular given to size. The size of a mouse organ compared to the size of a human organ is no, not comparable at all. And so when we were when we were thinking at the beginning of Tabla sapiens, how is it that we're going to try to get representation across the different regions? We have decided to balance the the compartments for for some issues for some tissues. Sorry, to try to get um, comparable representation. This comes at a cost that we are not really powered in the current version of the Atlas to look at relative compositions. Um, so in, ta in the Tabula Muricinis, we were able to actually look at compositions across the, across the different regions. The bladder is actually one of the examples that, um, that I used throughout the publication. But for sapiens, I think computationally, we would want to try to infer the relative abundances and I would rather suggest the same strategy was used donor to donor. So try to compare donor to donor and see if that gives you the information that you that you're looking for. Okay. 